All right, good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock here in San Diego, 3 o'clock on the East Coast. I'm Casey Green. We're at the ASU GSV Innovation Summit. And speaking with us for our opening conversation today is John Katzman. He is John, you're Noodle, but you're a lot of other things. And I really want to talk not so much about companies. I want to talk about industries. But John, probably more than anybody else in terms of a single name, was responsible for disrupting what today we know as the educational testing complex with Princeton Review some decades ago. And what was once an add-on buy often for affluent students now today has become almost ubiquitous to the point that the various testing agencies actually provide test prep services and resources for students across all kinds of schools and all kinds of income levels. John, welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. So let me give you a chance for a little bit of shameless self-promotion on your end. Talk to us a little bit about the early days of Princeton Review and pushing against particularly the College Board. We'll give you a chance to talk a little bit about what you're doing with Noodle as well. Then I want to talk about larger and more, what to me are the more interesting issues about being an outsider looking at issues and opportunities in education. It's funny, what, what I think about a lot at Princeton Review, first from a from a creating an organization point of view of just bringing together a, a bunch of terrific people and having a great deal of fun was that people just refused to understand what this test actually was. Like everybody had their thoughts about this is a test of math, this is a test of English, this is an important predictor of college, and it was none of those things. Um, and uh, we were putting 50 teachers into every test administration to come back and figure out like what worked, what didn't work, you know, what are they trying out now? And we actually knew the test at the molecular level and it was really hard to convince admissions officers and others like this is really what's going on here. That the test works really as a barrier as opposed to an A. The design of the test, at least the, merit, the industry would tell you, I think about Nick Merriman's book, the intent was in one sense, a meritocracy. We're going to help find a way to find the really bright students, and the testing would be the great equalizer, given other things. Turned out in some very different ways, though, historically. It did. Uh, and a lot of the people I've met at College Board over the years, including David Coleman, who's now its president, they're well-meaning good people. But uh, the test remains a, uh, a major social problem. It doesn't solve anything, it actually creates a new layer of, uh, of difficulties. And, you know, there's a saying that every problem starts life as a solution to a problem. And that's certainly true here, but we got to figure out what's going to solve this one. All right. You're doing some new stuff with Noodle. I know there are different parts to Noodle. Again, let me give you a moment for shameless self-promotion. So my last company was 2U, and we worked with the universities, mm -hmm. still work with the universities to create online programs. And the the thought was, you know, higher ed online that, that doesn't suck. The, the new company is a studio, and underneath it are three operating companies, but all of them are trying to solve the marketplace of education. Like, there are, at this conference, an incredible number of talented people and companies, and they really have a challenge in front of them if they're B2C to reach parents and students and for parents and students to find the, the right solutions. Just to be, I want to clarify acronyms, B2C is business to consumer. Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, if they are uh, working with higher ed, just to get in the door and to integrate with all of the different things that are going on on campus. And finally, uh, in K-12, just uh, the, the procurement process itself is so hard uh, that, that the company selling to districts, you might have a false positive uh, you get into one or two districts and you think, all right, I got this, but now you realize you're in a land war against an incumbent like a Pearson that, you know, they've been there a long time and, and they've got more troops than you do. So can we create a transparency and an openness to connect learners and educators and technologies more effectively? All right. So you don't have quite as much gray hair as I do, but you, you are too part of the institutional memory for a lot of things that have happened. It seems to me, let me get your opinion on this, that one of the things that strikes me about this current wave or this new round of significant investment in education, the excitement of education that differentiates it from a lot of the buzz during the dot-com era, is that during the dot-com era, there was a lot of interest. Let me go find an opportunity. I may not know much about that, but let me go cherry pick some things. So you have people coming into education. Online education is a good example of that. We can, yeah, this is a linear problem. We can figure it out. And, we know that that didn't work so well with lots of things, not just in education. The last four, five, six years, it seems to me that, that this new wave of energy excitement and by extension investment 
a lot of that's fueled by folks who are actually coming out, who have direct experience in education. They, they may have done a stint with Teach for America. They may have worked in a school district in some other way. They may have been on a college campus. And they're driven by a personal experience and an energy that says, you know, there's a better way to do that. Is there a, that a fair assessment in terms of a differentiator, why it seems a little different now as opposed to then? There are an awful lot of companies still that uh, they might understand the education side, but not the business side or the reverse. Uh, it still, it still has the feeling of, of everybody wants so much to, to make education better uh, that it attracts some capital and some people who might not be as directed and focused as, as they might be. A clear business model and a clear educational model, a plan to prove out that what they're doing actually changes student outcomes in a predictable way at a predictable cost. So I, I, I'm not sure we, uh, we are in the golden age uh, just yet, but the excitement here is really exciting, is, 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 is really uh, energizing. So let's talk about that excitement. I know you, you are an investor, but also you are a mentor to a lot of folks. Um, at a number of conferences, whether these kind of bake off or shark tank kinds of things, you're part of those conversations as well. What are these new rounds of educational entrepreneurs doing well? I think, uh, number one, they are spending money well, you know, they are... No really, more first buys of Arion chairs? That's exactly right. Uh -huh. It's not all about Arion chairs, it's not all about Super Bowl ads. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are taking the lean methodology uh, to heart. I'm not one of them, and I, and I sometimes uh, mm -hmm. regret that. Uh, uh, why don't you explain that for folks who haven't heard that term? Yeah, lean methodology basically says, look, there are ways of testing that are not expensive. You don't have to build out a whole product. Build out a minimally viable product and get a feeling for what people are looking for. If you're, you know, if you wonder what uh, price point uh, will work, well, tr uh, try buy a bunch of keywords, drive people to a site, and try it at different price points to see what people are excited by, which just get the click through to the next screen. And on the next screen, you can say, oh, by the way, we're giving you a special price of X. Uh, so everybody's getting the same price, they're getting the lowest price. You don't have to uh, fool anyone or charge them too much, but you can try out different things without committing to it uh, fully. And uh, you're constantly A-B testing everything. Yeah, they got, on, on the A-B testing, particularly with price, there's a lot of posturing on pricing on both sides in terms of, of the, the attitude of educational consumers, organizations, schools and colleges, and then also the providers. Special education discounts, a sense of entitlement, that A-B testing probably becomes very important. It does. One of the, one of the Noodle companies, Noodle Markets, uh, which is trying to solve K-12 procurement, one of our goals is scraping a bunch of data. We can actually say, you know, this product in your district is probably going to cost you X. And just the notion uh, of districts understanding what the pricing looks like. You know, the, here's the relative market share of the different providers, and here's, and here's kind of what they might cost, and here's which districts are using which uh, at scale, uh, I think is a, is, a, is a good starting point to procurement done right. But I think there's a flip side to that that I think young entrepreneurs often miss, and that is that my, the sale price is not my actual deployment cost that I'm looking at some multiple, and so that if I'm knocking on your door at a district or a school and say it costs X, the person on the other side of the table is thinking, yeah, it costs X, but in fact it's going to cost me some multiple of X for deployment, training, user support that's often missed on the part of the folks who actually want to bring something new and exciting uh, to both K-12 or higher education. Right, and th those, those sorts of problems of uh, this opacity and a tech infrastructure not at all built for the kind of stuff we're trying to do is uh, something I'm really interested in. I'm an investor in Clever. I think they're doing a really good job of making K-12 a lot more comfortable for a lot of companies that you don't have to hook into the student information systems at these schools, which are, which are uh, uh, at best uh, a fifty or hundred thousand dollar expense, but at worst, you know, virtually impossible. They're sort of guarded by the troll at the bridge who, yeah is going to make your life very, very hard before he's going to give you access to that data. The uh, Noodle partners were working very hard on a simple bus that connects into the university system so that when we bring a provider in to work with the university, they don't have any new integration costs. They've already uh, borne that cost one time with one university. And 
we're trying to create with open standards a simple ecosystem, uh, not unlike in some ways what Clever is uh, is doing. It's actually well. a build one, use many. That's right. Modality, great. What are the two or three things that the aspiring educational entrepreneurs need to do better? When you talk with folks, when people come knocking on doors, or you know, I'll say a little bit flippantly, coming to kiss the ring, John, help me. We've got something you, we'd like your counsel and advice, and maybe your money. Number one, uh, focus. A, a company should have one stream of revenue. It should have one client they're going after. It should be crystal clear. This is what we do. This is what we get paid. Here's how we'll know if we're doing a good job doing it. Uh, here's how scalable that market is. Like, what's the addressable market that that, that constitutes? Companies that come in and say, well, we'll get some money from here and some money from here, and you know, we'll kind of cobble together at a reasonable size company, it never go anywhere. It, it is a fierce focus on a business model and on uh, a solution that is measurably better than what's out there right now. And then number two is having a business model is good. It doesn't mean it's your business model forever. It means it is until you think of a better one and try it out in an A-B test uh, or pivot because your model isn't working. But uh, the companies say, I'm just going to uh, throw myself in here. I think it's a problem that needs solving, and you know, I'm going to figure out where the money comes later. I, I think that's very tough in education. It has worked in social media. I'm skeptical uh, of its impact in, uh, in the education world for a lot of regulatory and other reasons. I want to flip the conversation. Let's go to the other side of the table, because you have been on one side pitching. If you for the school districts, uh, for the campuses that are having first conversations with aspiring ed entrepreneurs, looks interesting, looks exciting, comma, but. What are some of the, the concerns that you hear in the but that need to be attended to? Well, you mentioned one of them, the cost of integration. This is going to cost X dollars a year for your terrific solution to this. What will it cost me to implement it? What will, are you FERPA compliant and, uh, and secure? And what are the holes I'm opening up uh, uh, to do this? I, I think that's the uh, the big scary part. And then number two, anything you bring in, there's something else you're not doing, right? We can't teach an infinite number of things. We've decided now we're going to teach kids to code. What are we not going to teach kids anymore? Are we going to decide not to do foreign language? Or are we going to decide not to do history? Um, and I, I think uh, educators are making the hard decisions about what they're doing right now that they can no longer afford either in time or money if they bring in you. Uh, and I don't think entrepreneurs a lot of times understand that. Yeah. And if I'm on the other side of the table, I'm a potential, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a school district, I'm a campus official, I'm a superintendent saying, you know, this looks interesting and exciting, but it looks risky. You know, what are the three or four things that I should be thinking about in one way to mitigate the risk and potentially help that firm? Because they have something that's interesting, that's exciting, and a potential great value to me, but they're not quite there yet. I think schools and universities are more open to innovation than they were 20, 30 years ago. I think the scaredness or the, the concern that uh, that something is going to go badly, badly, badly wrong is you not... It, you think it's unfounded? No, it's not unfounded, but no. it is. Uh, it is less a part of the thought process and the barriers. You're going to find somebody who's excited about it. The bringing in uh, in senior leadership or in your board of advisors, people who have a reputation, people who've looked at it and can give it a seal of approval is certainly important. Uh, at 2U, uh, I was pretty adamant that we're not the brand. Uh, the company was originally 2Tour two, two after my old dog Tour because I said, nobody, nobody cares who we are. They care who Georgetown is. They've been around for 300 years. They care a lot about who USC is. They've been around for 100 years. Big global billion dollar brands and reputations. And, uh, and the notion that I'm with that guy is, is pretty powerful here. Sounds like it's also a message about keeping your ego in check in terms of what the relationship is with your part, essentially your clients. Yeah. It, it, I can't stress that enough. I mean, in, in two different ways. Uh, the, the people with big egos uh, are certainly less interesting to educators. Uh, I'm a professor here at Duke, and I don't want to hear how lame we are and how we couldn't possibly survive without you because we've done so for quite some time, and we're pretty good at what we do. 
but it's also uh, people who walk in this space with real arrogance uh, just get their clocks cleaned because this is a really tricky space. There's shared governance, and so the whole governance process you really have You're to You're talking understand. about colleges and universities now, not Actually, K-12. Actually, K-12 no. has shared governance too in a lot of ways. I, I think it's uh, incredibly complex to understand how a district works. Each district is a separate thing. Each university is a separate thing. So, and that's just one element. That's just governance. When you look at the educational models and you know things that seem so clear to an outsider, even to someone who is TFA and, and who's taught, um, why are you using this versus this? Which kind of kids is it good for or not good for? I I think you have to approach just about everything with uh, with your ego very firmly in check. All right, so this is an innovation about design and particularly about evidence. And higher ed doesn't have a, and K-12 you know, still does a lot of stuff by epiphany, by argument, by opinion, as opposed to evidence. Is it is an outsider watching in? Are you seeing that the culture of evidence shifting a little bit? Because we're, we're getting, there's a lot of conversation about big data. There's a lot of conversation about algorithms, about how that will transform. We, we see a lot of conversation about providers saying, well, we've got a unique algorithm. It's our special sauce. It's our secret. The data culture may or may not be changing. The receptivity to data, both from inside as well as outside. What's your sense? Well, number one, research and education is widely ignored. Uh, and there's some good reasons for that. Uh, first, you know, let's take the gold standard, which is, you know, you've got some new antibiotic, you try it out in a controlled experiment, uh, uh, a relatively small sample size, but something done with rigor, and people are pretty comfortable saying that, yeah, this drug works or it, or it doesn't work. When you get into psychoactric, uh, psychoactive drugs, that's harder. When you get into education, the notion of a small controlled experiment having meaning to my cohort, to kids like this who are dealing with this, it uh, starts losing a lot of credibility. On top of that, in medicine, if you have a bad study, you have to publish it anyway. In education, that's not true. There's no law around that. And so the suspicion is, yeah, you did 10 studies. One of them, it showed gains, and that's the one you published. So we need a different way of thinking about evidence. We need to think as epidemiologists, not as uh, uh, controlled experiment uh, 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 medical researchers. Well, I get the risk of my own shameless self-promotion. I know that in colleges and universities, a lot of the investment that's made in innovation for technology for innovation, there's no follow-up in terms of does it make a difference. Maybe a quarter of campuses that actually do recurring you know, ongoing assessment of their technology investments. And I think that that leads, again, to a lot of presidents and provosts saying, you know, if it continues to fall short. Yeah. Uh, we have these great aspirations for technology as a transformative resource, not quite there. Let me close on that in terms of a question to you. What are the two or three things we really need to do better in terms of leveraging the power of technology for transformation? I think a big data approach to uh, research, uh, looking longitudinally. You know, you look at KIPP. Um, You're talking about the KIPP schools. The KIPP schools. And you look at their test scores versus the scores on at district schools nearby, and they're higher and people care or not care, it's no big deal, and, uh, and we, can, we can shrug. And then you look at kids who went to Kip Middle School graduate college four times as often as kids who go to the schools nearby. And now Mrs. Jones understands it. It's not enough to have data, you have to have persuasive data. Is this measuring something that anybody actually cares about that's going to affect uh, but you're also talking about an impatience about the data process. Well, you know, being that, impatient that, you know, in education is a career limiting move. This is a slow moving space and we have to have respect for that. It, you well, know, but also it's the impact may not be seen over time. So in fact, you've got two classrooms where the differential may be not statistically significant in terms of some metric in terms of a performance on a test or an experience, but you're talking about four years later, which is not part of perhaps the general assessment process, then you see the impact. It better be part of the general assessment process. No. Like it, it is crazy. You know, we look at these little short-term metrics, test scores and whatnot, and, uh, and, and think that those things correlate to long-term great outcomes that, you know, Gallup or somebody would measure. And there's very little evidence that that's true. And, uh, and we're not even trying to measure those things. And the accountability systems that we use in K-12 and that have been proposed for higher ed, you know, a lot of times miss the really important parts. Uh, they narrow curriculum and they steer things in a direction that, you know, uh, lots of educators, lots of parents don't buy into. So how we think about assessment, 
is critical to the long-term success of this industry, and we've got to do better than what we're doing. All right, but that's a public policy question issue as well in terms of the kind of the, the comments off, you know, many of us would argue, ill-informed that we overhear from legislatures, members of the legislature or governors talking about, let's get rid of philosophers and talk about plumbing. We saw this, for example, in Florida. Why, does, why should Florida have anthropology courses? Uh, in terms of it, it's all about the job as opposed to longer-term impacts. Our conversation should go on, can go on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. John, thanks very much for joining me. Thank Again, you, Casey. John Casman from the Noodle Companies, uh, the, the Noodle Organization. How should we frame it? The Noodle Companies. The Noodle Companies. All right, great. Thanks very much for joining us today, John. Take care. Sir. All right, we'll be back in a moment. Uh, next up with Jim Pazinski from the Gates Foundation. Give us a moment. Thanks.